as I told you at the end of last class. Sorry. As I told you at the end of, of last class, it was the eunuchs that clearly brought the downfall of the Chen dynasty. Did Chen want that loser son whose name, by the way, uh, the second emperor of the Chen dynasty, his name is kind of fitting. It's Hu Hai. Hu Hai, doesn't that sound like a sort of a moronic name? H-U-H-A-I, Hu Hai, second emperor. Was he the intended second emperor? Those of you who are actually college ready know how to read subtitles of films and answer that question. So I'd appreciate that, that decency from those of you. Thank you. I don't know why you, um, uh, I, no, I will be silent. Um, and as I said last time, it was the eunuchs, the inner court. And that's why we stopped to say, okay, so the first emperor did so many amazing things. How could his empire have been, or his dynasty have been the shortest, younger than you? Right? Shorter lived than you. You've already outlived it. And it was, and that's why we stopped and did the inner court and said, yes, although these guys lack their three precipices at the same, that's interesting, at the same time, uh, they had great power. And we see it in no greater example than in Zhao Gao. Whoops. Now, you should put the date if you don't already do that, and a mark so that you know most interesting thing starts at this point in my forum or in my journal and it ends at this point in my journal because that's your most interesting thing content from which to review. Um, I am starting to, like I read most of yours last night, those of you who didn't wait until the last minute, um, but, and, and answered quite a bit, sometimes clarifying, sometimes just going right on. That was really good. Um, so I want you right now to do the first thing. It's easy enough from our modern Western bubble, our world, our ideological world, we've been brought up saying that certain things are, are superior politically, economically, and socially. What's politically superior in our worldview, our conditioning, our ideology? What is politically superior? Thank you, democracy. Economically, what is superior? Capitalism. And capitalism says that what type of economy is best? Let's make sure that we understand that. If you don't know what capitalism argues, what does it, what does it say? Minimal government influence in the economy, and in two words, I think I heard somebody say it, free market. The market should be free. Actually, Adam Smith didn't say that. He said that banks particularly, the father of, of capitalism, of capitalist theory, he said that banks particularly, the finance industry particularly, should not be free. It should be regulated because he was sensible enough to know. You let bankers near millions and billions and trillions of dollars without having somebody come and make sure that they're not going, oh, I think I'll take a couple of billion, right? I think I'll cook my books. He knew that the financial professionals should be regulated. Adam Smith himself said that. It's conveniently forgotten by our uh, free market uh, ideologues today. But anyway, okay, so politically, democracy, economically, free markets, capitalism. Socially, what have we been taught is the best? Thank you, Sam. Equality. Speech. Should people be censored? I want you to write these things down because you are going to now be challenged to go at first glance, knee jerk, from my bubbled Western point of view. Everything about this man is bad, wrong, and undesirable. And I'm not saying that it's not. I'm pushing you to actually practice this amazing, interesting thing called critical thinking, where you go at first glance. In other words, everything that I've been conditioned to believe my entire life because I've grown up in one worldview, in one world bubble, you've been taught it. Most of you have not probably thought about what you've been taught. And that's where critical thinking comes in. To go at first glance, everything that this man did was wrong was reprehensible, repellent, and a million other SAT words. But on second glance, or on second thought, and so that's where I want us to go now. So make a some type of system in your journals, because most interesting thing, if you're just talking about the history, you're not getting the interest of history. We're doing points of view here. 
and you're actually shifting and looking from within his point of view. You're putting yourself in his shoes so that you possibly see what happens when you go, well, you know what? It's really easy to judge until you actually think. And we are really good at not thinking, but just going straight to judgment. And that's why half of you are not half. That's why so many of you students in high school are not real interesting because you go straight to judgment without thinking first. Is there more to it than my conditioning that leads me to judge with a knee-jerk reaction? So first, Chen burned books. He burned Confucian books. He burned Taoist books. He burned the, the Xu Jing, the Shu Jing. That's called censorship. That's a definite violation of universal human rights that we've been brought up to say are almost sacred. What else did he do that's a definite violation from our modern Western perspective of human rights? Thank you, Sam. He, let, let's go back to the censorship thing because there's another one, if you think orderly, yeah? Thank you, he buried scholars. He killed scholars. Now, who are these scholars and why did he kill them? Did he just hate people who liked books? Why did he kill them? It's not that simple. Why did he kill them? Let's make sure we understand. Yeah, Nikia? So did he kill just anybody to be a scholar? All Confucian and Taoist scholars, he just bloodthirstily killed them, just killed them all? I don't think so. HK? If I had more time to show you this, this, uh, it's, this is low budget, and so sometimes it's like, oh, man, if it was just higher budget, because the actors are really good. Um, but when there are crowd scenes, it's kind of embarrassing because, you know, he had the biggest army in the history of China, and the, and the army scenes have, like, you know, 200 guys marching, and, and when he comes to, to free a city or something, all the villagers come to the city gate, and there's, like, 25 people going, yay, right? And so clearly they don't have a big enough cast of extras. Um, but besides that, it's really, really well done, and it is based on uh, so much uh, records of the Grand Historian. But in any case... If I had time, I would show you the scene where uh, this killing of scholars and burning of books comes up because his advisor tells him to do that. Li Su tells him to do that, his legalist advisor. And Li Su uh, and, and Chen's smart son, not the idiot who just took power, his smart son said, Father, if you do that, just think real fast. Think real, real carefully. Do you really want to kill all the people who are simply saying maybe he should be Confucian. And do you really want to burn all the books, Father? Do you really want to listen to Li Su, your legalist? And, he, and, and Li Su persuaded him, yeah, you should kill him. Now, from Chen's point of view, let's, let's just stop with those two. Burn all the books that speak of ideologies different from legalism, the Xu Jing, the Sage Kings, Yao Shen and Yu, the, the, all the books of the Duke of Zhou, and kill scholars who refuse to stop talking about alternatives to legalism. Kill scholars who criticize your legalist solution to the Wayne State period. Is it so easy to call him a monster for doing that? That's as far as I'll go. Discuss amongst yourselves. Is this yours?
Okay, let's take it a little further. If, it, if that question seemed too obvious to you, let's take it a little further. What would Lisa have argued if you don't do it? And here's why you should do it, because Lisa, now can, because really, when we talk about Chen's decisions, we're basically talking about Lisa and Han Feza, the, the legalist philosopher who I'm reading right now. Um, so, so is Lisa just an evil guy? What is his, what is his, what's his reasoning here? Why is he saying, yeah, thanks, go ahead. So we were thinking that if, if you have people practicing other ideologies, you have a lot of like this community in, the, in China, and if there are issues like that, uh, what Lisa is trying to say that the net harm will be minimized if you do this harm now and to allow for possible issues in the future. Because again, to and thank you, and that's, that's right on, uh, because the danger of not acting now is what? What's the big danger of not acting now to, to suppress them, kill them, and if they won't shut up? And in the worst case scenario, thank you, another warring states period, right? Um, yeah? Uh, we said that he probably continued using legalism, and uh, Lisa was probably um, probably convinced him to burn all the all legal books and kill non legalist scholars because uh, it was through the legalist system that he was able to utilize the intellectual in the warring states period. Yep. And because of that, it was it would be pretty easy to believe that legalism is overall the way to go in terms of running a state. So I think he just carried his idea through um, through the Warring States period to the Qin Dynasty, and yeah. obviously that didn't really work out for him. Well, you say obviously it didn't work out for him, and that's what we're going to explore. It seems that way. It didn't work out for him. Um, let's go on. What other things? Did any, I mean, you probably didn't, but maybe you did. The Shang Dynasty film, they only make Bronze at night, the ruthless Shang Dynasty, blah, 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 time life thing, right? Did any of you get that same sort of hit from watching this about Chen? How it was just a sinister characterization of the man? So what other monstrous, sinister things did they emphasize that he did? Now this keeps going, so there's two. And, and you should be taking notes while discussing, right? Again, remember what? Like, do you have how many of you? If you don't have a way to like go, that was interesting, and put like MIT or something. Be smart with your notes, right? You know that you have to like go. This was most interesting to me. So as an idea comes up, something like MIT right next to it, most interesting thing, might help you to like go. Yeah, you know, this is this is one that I would definitely think about. So we've talked about two. He burned books, censorship, and by the way, just think about that for five seconds. That means all the books that we've read, anybody who owned them. This was a big, big book burning. Officials went out to every house where there was a known scholar in the village. They, they ransacked it, looked for their books, and burned them. China's past was wiped out. He kept copies in his imperial library of the banned books, and that was it. It was like erasing 1,200 years of Shang and Zhou history when he burned those books. That is intensely, intensely crazy. The Christians did the same thing to rival Christian texts in the Roman Empire when the Roman Catholic Church started in 330. There were other Christian texts, other Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which all like tell the same story of Jesus being resurrected and Jesus being God, John says that. The Gospel of Thomas, which says Jesus is not God. When the Roman Catholic Church was given the emperor's approval in the Council of Constantine uh, or of uh, Nicaea, and the John side won. Jesus is God. He rose from the dead, the resurrection. Everybody can be saved if they believe in him. When that argument won against the others, he said, no, he's a philosopher. All those books that argued, all those gospels that argued Jesus is a philosopher were also burned. The church sent out its officials to find all of the rival preachers' gospels and burn them, erasing 300 years of Christian history. So there's only one story left. Intensely interesting stuff when you think about the great book burnings of history. Um, and the fact that they are that, that they're being rediscovered. Now, what other thing? Now, now we'll go back to you. So, the third thing that they said that that was so brutal. He enslaved his people. He enslaved his people. Why? Because he just liked enslaving people. Okay. So discuss the Great Wall. Is he a monster for doing the Great Wall, from his point of view or from the legalist point of view? 
And I, I'm sorry, why and why? Not just a yes, no question. Wake up. So I come and slap him. Why did he build the Great Wall? If you think that you have, if you think that you have like actually thought, and this is an exercise in, uh, at first glance, if I think like a simpleton, in other words, think simply, judge it for, without thinking about it, that's simple thinking. At first glance, burning books is censorship. Oh, he's bad. At first glance, executing people who say what you're doing is wrong is bad. He's brutal. But on second thought, building the Great Wall and enslaving people to do it, he's bad. He's, you know, Hitler, Stalin, and Chen Shi Huang Di. He's bad. Oh, but on second thought, using harsh punishment to control the population. Think about that one. Let's go on down the list so that I don't have to keep stopping you. Banning production. You don't know about this one. It's not brought up, typically. This is a steely. I think I told you about this. S-T-E-L-E, -E, a stone tab, a slab. We'll be studying the man who set, the emperor who set this one up in like a lesson or two, Han Wu Di. Uh, I took my group up. This is from Mount Tai. So when Shen took his, when Shen took his um, imperial tours and he left his stone inscriptions, this is what he wrote on one of those stone inscriptions. So here's Chen making his words immortal, his report to the people and the spirits, whatever they might be, the nature spirits, the gods, whatever. Great are the emperor's achievements. He attends to what is basic. Farming is encouraged, not trade. What is he doing now that makes us go, oh my God, you have just like shot down another of our holy articles of faith in the West. Communism, that's a very, very anachronistic thing to say. Communism is in 1840s. Uh, let's, let, let's go back. Farming is encouraged, not trade. Communism is, okay, everybody be a farmer. Let's, think, let's, let's try to think clearly and not like based on comparative government. What did he just do to, to, to trade? Let's keep going. Farming is encouraged. Now, notice he doesn't say banned yet, not trade and artisanship, the making of, of, you know, crafts. The common folk, the common folk do prosper. As all under heaven are bound, all under heaven, that's the whole world, are bound with a single purpose. Everybody, everybody prospers. They're all bound with a single purpose. Tools and measures are made uniform, you know that, there's a standardization. So here he is, like he's like saying, this is what I have done. Writing was made the same. Wherever sun and moon shine, get the Taoist here, as far as one can drive and sail, men carry out their orders. I am a shadowy presence. Thus to realize their desires. Our emperor in accord with the times, in accord with the times, yin yang, timeliness, he has regulated the local customs and has made canals, divided the land. He has cared for the common folk, working day and night, unresting, and he did. Think about it. He was like the CEO of this empire called China. Reports came in from every commandery, and he had to read them and either approve or reject them or modify them. Emperors worked until midnight. They were like the, they were, they, it was not an easy thing. Working, and so this is not hyperbole here. Working day and night unresting, setting laws, leaving nothing to doubt. He has made known what is forbidden. The universe entire is our emperor's realm. Where the hell is it? <laughs> oh. 
What has he done to the free market? What does China think about this idea of the West? Oh, entrepreneurialism, business people, get a business idea and make gooky bags and what are those other things? The, what, what, what's that famous purse that all housewives have to have? Come. Prada, gooky, what's the other one? Oh, thank you. Uh, Louis of uh, Vuitton or Buistan, yeah, right? All of these things, right? all these luxury goods. What is his view on this? Are they basic? Does he seem to think that trade and, and luxury goods is a good thing for the people? What a horrible guy. Censorship, executes people for, for, for free speech, doesn't let people publish books, enslaves people to build a great wall, doesn't let people make Versace luxury items. But on second thought, what are your thoughts here? Go. What would he want? No, 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 discuss amongst yourselves with your new friends. Okay, so Chen Shi Huangdi allowed himself to be persuaded to build the Great Wall, even if that meant, and enslaving is a really bad word. Let's let's learn the the more proper word, which should be on here somewhere. Oh, uh, or just write it down because this is a this is a useful word when you're talking about ancient times where people are forced to work. To say enslavement is the wrong word because slaves are typically slaves forever. You have just ended their freedom for their entire life. They're somebody's property. Forced labor is a different category altogether. You're going to be forced to work on taming the Yellow River for the next two months, or you're going to be forced to work on the Great Wall for the next six months, whatever. That's a completely different concept than slavery, is it not? Okay, so anybody know what that, that word is called? That's a, that's a decent one, but there's a, another word uh, that's corvée that you'll often see, C-O-R-V-E with an accent aigu. Uh, the the French you know accent yeah. like the one in cafe C O R V E with an accent and then another E so C R C O R V E E now oh, there it is now so. As, as Harrison did with the, well, if he had let people continue criticizing his government when, after all, he has just unified a 300-year period of absolute horror for most families watching their brothers' husbands die and their mothers, daughters, sisters get raped by invading soldiers, um, maybe executing people who are, like, threatening the stability is a good idea on the short term. By the way, write this down too. It's a vocabulary stuff for you. Uh, a pattern. So, so this, is, this is a process thing. When a revolution comes, what is the first thing that the revolutionary victor has to, like, what is his first priority? I have just defeated my enemies and created a new order. Now, what's my first priority There's, in, in terms of stages? Wipe out everything. Well, let's say that he did that because he just wiped out all the, the rivals pacification, and we know that he did that. He disarmed everybody. He melted their weapons down in, into and made statues of them. So uh, the, the citizens were disarmed. It's called the consolidation stage. In, in this cycle of revolutions, the first thing that any founding 
generation has to do is to consolidate their regime. So consolidation stage. Lisa is telling him, so we've already seen, right? Oh, Jesus, we, this is not solid yet, right? It is not solid yet. There are people still criticizing it. Just because we've won doesn't mean that it's permanent. So we've got to be very, very, very careful here to make sure that this doesn't fall apart. So people are saying that this is wrong, that Confucianism or this or that are a better idea and we shouldn't cooperate. Well, maybe we should kill them because we have to consolidate this. These books are going around that start spreading ideas that, that threaten the consolidation of our government. Maybe we should burn them. Now, what about the Great Wall? Do you think, talk about the Great Wall. It's the consolidation stage. What sorts of debates do you think were going on when Lisa said, the nomads are invading. Let's force people to, to by the millions, go leave their families and create the Great Wall. Do you discuss, discuss that decision on the part of the Chen Emperor? Oh, yeah, that's right. No food today. But lots of caffeine. Okay, so do you think that which do, which of these do you think was the easiest the easiest decision for him to make, and which do you think was the hardest? Of all of these, because again, clearly, you know, the guy wants people to like him, to be, he wants to be popular, he wants to be approved of, and at the same time, he's like, he's having to do things for the sake of a consolidation that he knows they're not going to be popular. Oh, Jesus, I have to burn these books. So many people like these books, but you persuaded me, Lisa. Burn them. These people won't stop talking. They're such fanatical Confucians or Taoists or whatever. You persuaded me, Lisa. Kill them for the sake of consolidation. Now, the Great Wall. Let's make millions go, 700,000, whatever it was, go and leave their families and their farms and their fields for six months or a year or two to build the Great Wall. Which of these do you think was the hardest decision for him to make in terms of the cost? Good, the economic drain. Now, and so what do you think what do you think persuaded him to go? Despite the fact that it's going to remove people from the fields, it's going to lower our revenues from, from agricultural taxation, it's going to lower our agricultural production, which might cause inflation because there's less food, which will make people unhappy. People are also going to be unhappy because their families are broken up. Why do you think he said yes to it? Using harsh, does anybody disagree with that? So, so what can we infer about the, the nomad threat at this particular time in Chinese history? Notice, have they been a big threat as we've, as we, as we've read so far? I guess they did burn down the King Yo's capital when they invaded to end the, the Western Zhou. But, um, but yeah, it's a big, this is the, it's a confederation right now of nomadic tribes. Remember we talked about how there were little schools of fish? But the Xiongnu group, X-I-O-N-G, N-U, the Xiongnu, actually confederated, like the Iroquois Confederacy, you know, in, in the U.S. history, right, where different tribes would get together and make a much larger confederation, bigger population, bigger army, all sorts of stuff. So the Xiongnu had a confederation, and so they were now a very, very threatening big army, Mongol-ish, um, Genghis Khan-ish, because Genghis Khan did the same thing. He unified tribes for the, the Mongol conquest. Um,
using harsh punishments to control the population. I'm trying to simply to, to get you to like see far more clearly than you would in a in a 10 minute PowerPoint slide about the first emperor of the Qin Dynasty, which is criminal in a, any world history course because it says, okay, this is what he did. You think about it for five minutes. You make a judgment without thinking about it. You're simplistic when you leave that class, and then you go on and make simplistic judgments about him for the rest of your life. This is your one opportunity to think about the first emperor and be really interesting whenever people talk about the terracotta warriors. Um, who do you think, who do you think, was, who, who do you think most needed to be intimidated by the threat of harsh pu punishments? I don't, do you get my question? I have just ended the warring states period. Say more. And please speak up so that this microphone can hear you. I think that the nobles and officials would be perhaps the most bent by this harsh punishment because before the Qin Dynasty, the warring, in the warring states period, they were trying to seize power, and that's why there were seven states initially. And so they needed to be kind of put down and to, to make sure that they would kind of seize power, and so they knew that they were not. And so these, these former nobles who have just lost all of their status, all of their land, all of their wealth, all of everything, and been reduced to a common position instead of standing up above everybody and looking down on them. What do we call this class of people, again, in the stage of revolutions, in the, 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 the process of revolutions? We have just eliminated a class. We have just won a revolution. Now this class of people, they're called what class? The ones who want to turn back the clock. No, they, it doesn't have to be aristocrats. If, it was, if Occupy Wall Street had won and they had killed everybody in, in Wall Street and taken, taken all of the wealth of the capitalist rich, they're not aristocrats. They're bourgeoisie. But they would be the same type of class. This is my point. If, if, if all of the people who work in banking right now were to be stripped of their, their wealth, stripped of their property, and stripped of what society said, you're the problem, and we're ending you as a problem, and you are now equal with everybody else, you're not looking down on them from your Wall Street corner office, what class of people do they become politically? We have just had a revolution. They are, you don't know this terminology, counter-revolutionaries. They're counter-revolutionaries. There's always going to be the class that loses who wants to turn, who wants to, to counter revolution. And as Nikita so intelligently inferred, Chen just abolished a very powerful group of nobles across six or seven states. They want their land back. They want their fiefs back. They want their status back. They want their wealth back. They want their property back. Doesn't matter if it's a communist revolution, a French revolution, an American revolution. Those that lose don't like it and they want to counter that revolution. It's the counter-revolutionary class. And so, yeah, harsh punishments, don't you think? Don't you think there's going to be necessary for the people who two weeks ago had a hell of a lot of land, power, and fancy titles and don't now? They're still alive. Consolidation stage. Now, we haven't talked a lot about economics in this class so far, have we? We've talked about Chinese political evolution from the Shang theocracy to the Zhou mandate of heaven to the Western Zhou age of hegemons and warring states period. We've talked about the political evolution, the Achilles heel of Zhou feudalism. We've talked about the social, but we haven't talked about the economic. Discuss amongst yourselves because you should be able to like actually like go, if I remember, if I, if I, if I remember, I can, I can guess or possibly even think I know how land was land bought and sold or was land not a free market commodity to be bought and sold discuss amongst yourselves what do you think maybe this maybe that I'm, i think i remember this what do you think in the in the joe dynasty in the feudal era was it bought and sold on the market like it is today i want to buy a piece of property could you do that back then that's an economic question discuss amongst yourselves not just yes or no but why
What do you think? Was it or was it not? Okay. What are our thoughts at this table? Was it was it a free market commodity bought freely bought and sold? Was there a land market? No. This table, do you think there was? Okay. Then how was it? How was it distributed if it wasn't bought and sold? How was it distributed? In the traditional way, and during the feudal age, HK. It was awarded by a king to his vassals. Did it end there? Let's let's go straight down that hierarchy. King gives it to vassal. Vassal now has a big fief the size of Vermont, whatever, or New York. And okay, so how do you deal with that that fief? No, I'm saying goes. Thank you, Nikita, for going straight down the hierarchy and thinking logically instead of randomly. The the the, the Lord did. The Lord appoints officials to take care of certain parts of the land specifically to HK, and then from there the officials will hire people to work on the land. They won't hire them because they belong to the land. They're like serfs. They belong to the land. They're farmers. Yeah, yeah. Now. And so just to just to clarify that, because because this is all very interesting when you think about modern China. I've got a couple of students in the forums, which I'm reading now. And don't you uh, I'm having some problems with the forums. Thank you for your thank you for your patience just in advance, right? Because that checklist thing that helps you, that's hurting me because it's conflicting with the forum that I like the question and answer forum where you have to reply to me and you can all see each other after thirty minutes. You have to think first and then you can thirty minutes later like see what everybody else writes. Um it's easy for me because it's all at one glance. But anyway, um some people are starting to get it. Some people are like going, wow, it's amazing, you know, um, Xi Jinping, the, the current president of China, has just implemented an anti-corruption campaign that is saying that government officials and the people in the, in the Chinese Communist Party cannot go to five-star restaurants anymore. You are having too much luxury, and that is as bad as being too poor. You are becoming too wealthy. So we will stop that, says Xi Jinping, this year. It is so interesting. And so, and so one student who's really cool, I don't recall who it was, was it? I don't, uh, was like, we see the sumptuary code back in 2014. I'm like, you see it, you see it. Well, in the same way, these economic things are so interesting. Knowing the ancient is not irrelevant. It makes knowing modern China and current events so much more interesting. So how did the, okay, so as Nikita said, from King to, to vassal. Vassal now has a big fief. Vassal then gives land to his ministers. Ministers then give land to their officials because they're all inherited. And each one of those pieces of land has farms on it. Hello, it's agricultural, 90% of the population agricultural. How is that farmland distributed? Because after all, the farmers have to be able to eat and things can get too crowded. So they had what was later called the well field system. Picture what's okay. Who knows Chinese? What's the word for uh, what's the word for uh, well? As in like a well that you get water out of. What's the word for enter? Lie. Okay, sorry, Jean. Right. Now, so take off the the talking uh, helping character for man. What's the central? What's the main component of that character? Just draw it. Just draw it in the air. Uh, not that fast. Isn't it the tic-tac-toe board? Huh? Um, uh, whatever, right? But it's that, right? What is this? What is this word? Jing, right. And that means? Well. Oh, this means well? No, not with the, not with the, I'm sorry, that's supposed to be this. Right, right. So this is well. But what's the word with the helper? Enter, lie, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, remember, I've only taken two months of Chinese last summer, and I haven't reviewed it since. Uh, so that's a well. That is obviously, hello, that's obviously an ancient Chinese character. The well is right here in the center. How did the, how did the farms distribute the land? Stay with me, Ria. How did the farms distribute the land? How did the, the 
How did the farmers have the land distributed to them, divided up? You have water in the center. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You've got a family here, a family here, a family in each of the eight outside areas. And that's their private land. And that's what they get to farm and eat on and survive on, right? And even sell on a market if they want to. They're surplus. That's the land given to them. The central land, that one-ninth of this territory, that's what they had to farm in common, all of them together, and give to the, the person who owned, quote, them. Right? So this was called the well-field system or the equal field system. Okay? Notice there's some equality in terms of land distribution involved in that. Because it is a grid, and each family gets the same type of grid. So land was not bought and sold. Back to our economic land policy, economic policy. It was not bought and sold. It was the possession of the government. And the government distributed it. Come on. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a Western Joe type of thing. Uh, this pen works. That's why I don't want to lose. Oh, well, I guess I'll just. Hell and damnation. Can you turn on the lights for a second, please? Because I just lost a lid to a pen. That's... All of them, all of them, all of them. Where is it? Is that bizarre? That's crazy. Okay. Uh, are we hallucinating? Huh? No. Okay. Well, that's too oh, look at that. Look where it ended up. It bounced up onto a stack of books and rested on top of a stack of books. It dropped onto the floor and bounced up onto the top of a stack of books. All right. So we're talking economic policy now. During the legalist system, when aristocrats lost their land in the Warring States period, they actually opened up in order to... Um, for the government to get money, they actually opened up land to be bought and sold. This is so ironic. During the Warring States period, the legalists said, look, King, you need money. Sell the territory to people. Let them buy it. And so you had, for the first time, a free market and land under the Warring States legalism, which in a sense is very strange because suddenly legalist sounds a bit capitalist. You, can, you, can, you got money, you can buy land. You don't have money, you can't afford land, that sort of thing. In any case, that was all that was all warring states period in order to gain power. Now, Chen has gained power. And that's finally our last economic concepts. Please write this down. So we're doing economic vocabulary and we're doing just an overview of China's economic values. You just saw the basic when Chin on his steely said the basic is encouraged and the secondary or the non-essential trade and, and artisanship is discouraged. These are the philosophical concepts of the economic theory concepts of the ancient Chinese. They classified production and industry into two categories, two basic categories. The first was called, variously depending on the English translation, the basic, as we saw in the Chin steely. Basic or essential is another word for it, or primary production. Right? Yeah. If artisanship was uh, discouraged, then why were there so many artists available to the terracotta? We'll get to that. And thank you for bringing up the terracotta army. I have to. I have to. Uh, uh, terracotta. Just very quickly. I forgot to put this in the lesson plan because I'm rewriting them because mine were two years old and 
I've read and learned so much since then. So I forgot to put the Terracotta Warriors. You know that each the, each of those warriors is mass mass produced assembly line, mass produced. It's kind of economic. They weren't individually sculpted. They were assembly line sculpted. They all had the same molded parts, and they were put together like Barbie dolls. But then they put on, you know, just put the arm on it, right, and put the hand on it. Um, but then they individualized each one of them by giving each one a different face, a different, a different face, different hair, different costume. Why the hell would you go to that much trouble with 8,000 statues? Why would you go to that much trouble to individualize them? You've mass produced them to simplify the labor. But Chen said, no, I want them to have the features that distinguish them into individuals. It's actually interesting. And they, and they, I'll cut to the chase because this is not, I didn't even tell A4 this. Does anybody have any theories so far about why he would individualize them? Yeah, HK, go ahead. Theories are good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It is kind of contradictory, and that's the, that's the very point. Because you want unity, and yet you're showing, you're also showing ethnic, because it's an empire now. And so you have some who look Han Chinese, you have some who look Mongolian, some who look Tibetan, some who look Southern ethnic tribes. And we think, we don't know, but we think that he went to that trouble because it was a symbolic, again, a symbolic act of pride. I have unified all of these diverse people. China is one again. Just like the language is one again, so it doesn't matter what language, you've got all these different language groups, but it's one people again. Ethnically, there are a million different ethnicities, and I'm going to make sure that they are all visible in these terracotta warriors' faces so that the people can come and see. Look how diverse the peoples of the Qin Empire were. Look how he unified literally all under heaven to them because there was nothing outside of China that they could see. Now, so the primary, the essential, the necessary goods, and then the secondary, the non-essential, unnecessary goods. Those are the two economic categories. And Chin said that the secondary, the unessential, the unnecessary production of goods was a bad thing. Now, what was your question? If it was a bad thing, then why were there so many oh, terracotta warriors and such? Notice it didn't say, okay, so let's think about this more. Isn't it, isn't it good? Thank you for asking the question. Because when you think about it a little more, you're like, okay, artisanship. It didn't say banned. It said agriculture is discouraged and not artisanship, trade and artisanship. It didn't say it's is encouraged, but not. It didn't say as they're outlawed. It just said they're not encouraged. Artisanship is craftsmanship. Which artisan activities do you think would, do you think all of them would be classified as unnecessary? What artisan creativity products would be classified as necessary and actually valued and promoted? Thank you. Yeah, like basic tools. Metallurgy? Four? Nice, nice Maserati um, tools plows? But if you're doing metallurgy for nice Maserati stuff, a chariot that's nicer than the king's chariot, no, that's not necessary. Now, what do you think of this? What do you think of his resistance to a free market? Were you able to go on first thought, but on second thought? What were the most interesting ideas that came out of your on second thought? I'll take that. How do you think the people felt? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
really nobody else, all of you quiet people, nobody else has ideas? Do you make the class so less interesting when we only have three people talking? Thank you, Chris. Would the government can gain more if, if they monopolized all the industries? Okay. We're assuming they monopolized them. We don't know that they monopolized the artisan industries. Um, but if they did, then they would gain more. But he wants to rule like a shadowy presence with laws. I would think that he's probably just regulating industry. He's probably not wanting to own it because he wants to rule like a shadowy presence and just make sure that that things are regulated and that they're following the law. So business people, artisans, you probably got officials regulating the, the economy that way. How would the people like? How would the people like not being able to buy luxury goods? To me, that's the interesting question. Jack. My, my Honor Society AP guy, how would the people feel in a state that said, you can't buy luxury goods? Okay, so Jack just gave us the, the on first glance. And the reasons behind this might be. And they would put the whole of China prospering together instead of their individual indulgence, their individual indulgence in luxury goods. They would like approve of that because they like go, oh, yeah, okay, it's just to keep us together. So I'm willing to not indulge in luxury because it's just to keep us together. Okay, <laughs> you're making me tired. Are you tired? Um, Jacob. Do any of you think that this is, on second thought, this legalist? Oh no, let's go back. I'm sorry. There are a couple things. I'm getting. I'm. I'm. I'm following trains of thought that I just find interesting, and it's taking me away from my lesson plan. So let me finish my lesson plan. Um, Sidebar, philosophical view of businessmen, ancient Chinese view of businessmen and merchants. In the Taoism packet, it asks you, what were the Confucian and Taoist thoughts on business on, and wealth? It was topic seven, I think, or six. If anybody was assigned that, at a table that was assigned that, do you remember your basic answer? Did Taoism approve of, or the rest of you for that matter, did Taoism approve of the pursuit of wealth? What's our evidence from Zhuangzi or the Lao Tzu? The Tao Te Ching, the Yin Yang, and Zhuangzi, the, the, you know, Jesus on acid. Um, what's our evidence that they said that the pursuit of profit is not an admirable thing? It's commonly acceptable at this point of trust, but if it's, not on, if it's not on the honor of the path, you shouldn't pursue it. Yes. Confucius said that, not the Taoists. Confucius said, everybody wants well, everybody wants to be prosperous, but if you have to sell your decency to become rich, I would rather be a street sweeper or a gatekeeper, he said. Okay. No, but thank you. Yeah, right? What did he say? He said uh, a, 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 a superior man pursues righteousness. A low man, a small man, a petty man, a base man seeks profit. He did not have a high regard for people who said, the best thing in life is to compete to get as rich as you can. Again, they are so radical. It's just so interesting because they're so radically different from us, right? Democracy, no. Benevolent dictatorship. Freedom, no. Law or shame. Individualism, no. Communalism, collectivism. Business, no. Agriculture, simplicity. The Taoist, Zhuangzi is offered a job by the king of Chu, and the king of Chu's ministers come to him, and he's fishing in a river. And do you remember the story? It's the coolest story in the world. The turtle, right? And they're like, oh, the king of Chu, which is the biggest warring state, right? In the southeast, that was the big one. It was one of the last two standing. 
And uh, the King of Chu wants you to be his prime minister. He's heard you're a sage. And Zhuangzi doesn't even turn his back when he's got the two like messengers of the King of Chu, and he just keeps on fishing. And uh, like that old man that we saw in the movie just now, in the TV show. Uh, and he goes to, do, do you remember the story? Do you want me to recap? Because it's, it's, it's very famous from Zhuangzi. And he's, he was like, I heard that. They're like, well, he wants you to be his prime minister. He's heard you're a sage in this warring state's time. This would be like somebody coming into this room and saying, Mr. Burrell, President Obama wants you to be a secretary of education. You'll make 150 a year. You'll meet the most important people in the educational industry. You'll be paid $30,000 a speech for the rest of your life. Go give a speech at some American club somewhere and get paid $30,000 for talking for an hour. That's your life, man. Check it out. Do you want it? And it would be like me going, I have heard, Zhuangzi said, I've heard that in the King of Chu's throne room, there is a turtle wrapped in silk that has been there in the place of honor for a thousand years. Do you think that turtle will be more happy now? Is that turtle alive if it's been there in a place of honor wrapped in silk? No, it's clearly a dead turtle. He says, do you, he goes, do you think that turtle would prefer to be so wrapped in silk, honored and esteemed in the seat of power? Do you think it would rather be here in the river dragging its tail in the mud? And he never turned his back. This is a great detail of the Zhuangzi. Zhuangzi never even turned around to look at these um, important men and their ties. Uh, he just got fishing. And uh, they said, well, yeah, you know, when you think about it, he'd probably rather be, obviously rather be dragging his tail in the mud. And Zhuangzi said, I'd rather be dragging my tail in the mud too, so leave. And he never turned around. And he just sent them on their way. Did Zhuangzi and the Taoists approve of the pursuit of wealth as the way to longevity, good health, and mental hygiene? Clearly not. The pursuit of power and wealth and individual and business and enrichment and greed and the profit motive. Did the legalists approve of business people? No. No. Hello. We have discouraged the, the, the secondary non-essential industries. We have discouraged trade. Look at this. Our Venn diagram of Chinese philosophies, the hundred schools of thought, Confucianism, Taoism, legalism, they all differ in most ways. But at the center, they agree on one thing. Who should you give the least respect to in all of society? Those who buy, dear, buy cheap and sell dear, buy cheap and sell expensive and put the, the rest in their pocket so they can get rich. Business people are the lowest. Now, here is the social order of China's social hierarchy. We're now doing social. We just went from economic. So they are an anti-mercantile society. Spam. On the top of this social hierarchy now, because notice there is no aristocracy anymore. So we're in a new age. On the top of the – hello. Yes, hurry. I'm – hurry. Sorry. Yeah? I can at the end of class. Bye. Harrison, go to Ms. Harvey at the end of class. Um, SPAM. This is their social hierarchy, and it will continue for the next 2,000 years. So SPAM stands for scholar. Notice who is at the top. Not Donald Trump, one of the most unscholarly but richest people in the world, but scholars who are intelligent, who are studious, who are wise, who are, have proven their ability to study and to care about learning and to value the opportunity to learn. Scholars are put on top. Who is next? Mm -hmm. Peasants, because they produce something valuable. It's basic, it's necessary, and it's essential. They feed us. They deserve our respect. They work hard, and they do work. They don't just gamble, buy cheap, and cheap people by selling deer. Peasants are next. It's a, I hate that word. I think farmers is a far more connotatively respectful word. But anyway, we'll go with peasant because it was, it's hard to say, to say spam. Um, hey, artisans, they make useful things, weapons, tools, pots, pans, beds, furniture, houses, construction, roads, on and on. And at the bottom, merchants. I can't hear you. 
Oh, they called them parasites. Yeah, so, so the, uh, in, in all of the ancient Chinese texts, merchants are often metaphorically referred to as parasites because they, they suck the blood of working people. They don't make anything themselves, and they just fatten themselves on the work of a host. Whoever is what artisan is making it, they'll buy it cheap from this person who makes the silk cloth, and then they'll go and sell the silk cloth expensive at the market. They don't produce anything. They're parasites on the silk makers. The farmers who grow food, they buy it cheap from the farmers, they take it to the market, and they sell it dear, and they put the profit in their pockets. They don't make anything. They're parasites. Um, that is what the, the Chinese called them. So, so if all of that, okay, so I hope that at the end of this discussion of the Chen, and we're leaving it now because the Chen is going to fall, you saw him die. So let's talk about the death of Chen, and let's ask ourselves, did legalism not work? What was it that ended legalism? Was legalism a problem here, or was it just the consolidation stage itself was a problem? This is what I want you to enjoy thinking about. We have two more minutes. Do you think that Chen, the Chen Dynasty may have lived, continued a thousand generations like he thought it would, if any of these somewhat random factors had not happened? Which one? Which factors are random and cause the Chen to fall? The eunuchs? Okay, so, so the eunuchs cause the Chen to fall by doing what? They altered the what? The will. And so, okay, so what's the weakness? What's the flaw of this dynastic system then? No? That's, in order to cut to the chase, disagree with me if you do. If you, if, I don't think I'm wrong. The succession thing, right? The wait for the, the, the dying king to say, this is the one who will definitely follow me, right? That mechanism of passing power to the next generation, the succession thing, that's a fatal flaw, one. Two, I think there's a bigger one than the succession thing. I think that even an idiot, by the way, the uh, most interesting thing to me if I were writing one, this is the dynastic cycle writ small. Plato said that the, the, the state is the individual writ small, written small. In other words, the republic, Plato's republic, he says that a government is an individual person written small, or no, uh, written large. So this is a dynastic cycle writ small, right? How many generations did the Chen Empire go through? From the greatest, greatest founding ancestor to the biggest freaking loser ever, who high, in two generations. It's not a 300-year dynastic cycle. It's a 15-year dynastic cycle from spiritual giant to mental midget. <laughs> um, so the succession policy. But I think that even with an idiot on the throne, what were the other factors that led that, that possibly, had they not been there? What was the biggest reason that people got pissed off at the chin? The forced labor. Because notice, the aristocrats, they're a small... A small percentage of the population to anger. But when you start sending millions to build the Great Wall, then you're starting to anger townspeople all over the place, the common people. I'll leave you with this question. If it weren't for the Xiongnu just happening to be a confederation, big, serious military threat to China's north at this time, if they had like come up 50 years later as a big military threat, would the Qin Dynasty have been able to survive? I think, I think it's arguable that, that yes, because they wouldn't have needed to build the Great Wall, and he could have continued consolidating. The consolidation stage had some tragic timing to me. Anyway, that's it. Um, you just have an MIT forum due next class.